One of the strange things about the Bible itself as we have it today is that the one thing it really doesn't speak about is the canon itself, like what actually constitutes canon. And this creates a great deal of confusion because between the various churches and denominations, we have a great many differences in terms of canon. And the funny thing is that these disagreements are sort of... Um, sort of um, in contrast to the few places in the apocryphal literature anyway where the concept of the canon actually is um, spoken of. Um, and in both of these instances, at least the two that I can think of, one of them is in the second book of Ezra, or some call it the fourth book of Ezra, um, and the other one is in the Gospel of uh, Thomas, uh, saying 52. Um, I'll start with the one in second Ezra because it is presumably the older of the two. Um, we see Barnabas, for example, alluding to this book, and also um, Paul apparently alluding to this book uh, in at least one or two places. Um, and what's uh, interesting about it, this is in 2 Ezra chapter um, 14. And um, basically what's going on here is that Ezra is having to write out scriptures, and he's got these five scribes who are writing things out as he is reciting them. Um, it's very fun place. Here we go. Um, this is on the third day. Um, it says, um, okay, um, beginning at 14.1, it says, on the third day I was sitting under an oak tree when a voice came to me from a bush saying, Ezra, Ezra, here I am, Lord, I answered and rose to my feet. The voice went on. I revealed myself in the bush and spake to Moses when my people Israel was in slavery in Egypt and sent him to lead my people out of Egypt. I brought him up onto Mount Sinai and kept him with me for many days. I told him of many wonders, showing him the secrets of the ages and the end of time, and instructed him what to make known and what to conceal. So first off, this is with reference to Moses, okay? Um, and when he was bringing these people out of Egypt, remember, what does it say in Revelation, Egypt? and actually Sodom represent, right? This was the city where our Lord was crucified, that is to say, Jerusalem. So he's leading them out of Egypt. He's leading them out of, you see, organized religion, right? That's what Egypt, in a sense, represents, uh, Sodom and Egypt. And as we read in Peter, of course, Babylon as well. So all those three, you know, images are of the church and of organized religion. So anyway, but he's giving you the idea here in Second Ezra that what was revealed to Moses was partly to be revealed and partly to be concealed. So that's one thing. Um, and it says, and I instructed him what to make known and what to conceal. So too, I now give this order to you. Commit to memory the signs I have shown you, the visions you have seen, and the explanations you have been given. You, yourself, are about to be taken away from the world of men. And as it speaks of the world of men, of course, is, you know, the earthly logic. The, the, because, because all of this stuff, all of this history and everything, and all of this nature and everything, all of this stuff, is imposed upon matter in the material realm in much the same way that music or data is modulated in such a way as to create illusions of sound and illusions of images and those kinds of things. Here we have illusion of matter. Anyway, um, it says that you yourself are about to be taken away from the world of men. Uh, in other words, the people are not going to countenance this way of thinking anymore. People aren't going to respect or to understand these mysteries. And, and that's what makes them work, of course, is because people discount them and ignore them. And it makes it perfectly um, easy, I guess, for God in the end to, if there is a rhyme, and if there is a reason to all this, to sort of, uh, to sort of uh, come back and explain it in retrospect and make it all very easy to understand in plain language. It says, um, and thereafter you will remain with my son and with those like you. So his son is in a sense to be taken away from the world of men as well, right? Again, he says, Jesus, of course, is the son of God. He says, where I am going, ye cannot follow, right? And people all wonder what that meant. Of course, that was in the language of parables. Um, because, again, he's following in that same vein, you know, to be taken away from men's understanding, in a sense, by giving themselves over to the world of men. They, they in a sense, escape it. Um, it says, the world has lost its youth. And time is growing old, for the whole of time is twelve in twelve divisions. Nine divisions and a half the ten have already passed, and only two and a half still remain. Set your house in order, therefore. Give warnings to your nation, and comfort to those in need of it, and take your leave of mortal life. 
Put away your earthly cares and lay down your human burdens. Strip off your weak nature. Set aside the anxieties that vex you and be ready to depart quickly from this life. However great the evils you have witnessed, there are worse to come. This, at this aging world grows, as this aging world grows weaker and weaker, so will evils increase for in its inhabitants. And I think we're seeing that now. I mean, just pollution, depletion, you know, the, the cultural uh, degradation that we see, the, the attack on all of our traditional values and just right and wrong. It's becoming basically all evil all the time as it was in the days of Noah. Um, in any case, um, the truth will move farther away and falsehood come nearer. And again, we're seeing this happening. The kingdom of death is just upon us. The eagle that you saw in your vision is already on the wing. May I speak in your presence, Lord, I replied. I am to depart by your command after giving those uh, warning, giving warning to those of my people who are now alive, but who will give warning to those born hereafter? The world is shrouded in darkness, and its inhabitants are without light. For your law was destroyed in the fire. Again, light and law are contrasted just as they are compared, in other words, just as they are in the canonical tradition. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and, I, um, and a light unto my path. Um, and so no one can know about the deeds you have done or intend to do. Um, okay, let me just put a little side here. Uh, it says, for your law was destroyed in the fire, so no one can know about the deeds you have done or intend to do. Now, this is somewhat ambiguous because in a real sense, in a materialistic way, it may well have been that this law was burned. But because everything in the, in, the, in the word of God is the spiritual couch in fleshly terms and everything fleshly carries with it this corresponding heavenly reality, um, the word being destroyed um, in people's minds is just as well as the word being destroyed physically. In other words, if, if you don't have it and if you don't understand it, those are kind of alike in terms of their meaning. Like you may well have the word in front of you, but if you don't understand how to interpret it, you may miss out. Now, when he says here that no one can know about the deeds you have done or intend to do, what he's saying is those things which have been done and those things which he intends to do are in the law or in the scriptures, right? And in what way are they in the law or in the scriptures? Um, one place where we find a tantalizing clue of this, in fact, I think we have a full-blown revelation of this, because Barnabas obviously read um, the second book of Ezra, so the book that I'm reading now, because he quotes it. There's a, there's a separate quote about the, the, the tree bending over and dripping wood and all that, and Barnabas refers to that, so we know that he's read this book. And possibly with this particular passage in mind, he kind of, uh, he speaks of, uh, along a similar vein about uh, how the future is, um, is held up in parables to be understood, uh, I guess, in a future generation. Uh, it says, because he, 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 this is a transitional paragraph, chapter 17 of Barnabas is only two, chap or two verses long because it's so short, it's just a transitional thing. He goes right from interpreting the Old Testament and talking about the Sabbath and all that stuff and interpreting, recasting all that Old Testament stuff in an allegorical sense into Christianity and into what has happened, what will happen and what, you know, is happening at the moment. And then he transitions, of course, into the kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness stuff that I kind of alluded to before. And then finally ends up with the, you know, the coming of the Antichrist, or not actually the revelation of the Antichrist, put it that way. Um, but Barnabas 17, too, kind of sort of brings something up and just drops it like that. Um, it says, well, as I'll read the whole chapter, it says, for as it was, uh, so far as it was possible with all simplicity to declare unto you, my soul hope that thou had not omitted anything of the matters pertaining unto salvation, and so failed in my desire. So, in other words, he's tying the concept of salvation with interpreting the Old Testament allegorically, which also is interesting because that comes into play in Jude as well as Second Peter. Um, but then it goes on, 17.2 continues, it says, For if I should write to you concerning things immediate or future, you would not understand them because they are put in parables. So much then for this. So, in other words, he, he, he tells you that everything about the present and everything about the future is couched in parabolic terminology. And he's not about to go into that. He's just letting you know that they are. And so what that means is later on in the future, when you read that verse and you think, hmm, so he's telling me that the things that were then are being preserved in the language of parables. 
and that future things are couched in parables such that maybe we who are in the future, if we are given this revelation, not only will we see the so-called future things, the things that he spoke of were coming in the future in parabolic form, that we understand them retrospectively, we understand them that he could see across time and he could understand across time and that all the other prophets and stuff, if this turns out to be true, that you can read these things backwards as you decode the parables and it unveils history in retrospect then you do have some sense that these people were speaking across time. What it takes is an understanding of the language of parables. Anyway, so he pretty much just picks it up and drops it. He goes, for if I should write to you concerning things immediate or future, you would not understand them because they are put in parables so much then for this. But let us pass on to another lesson in teaching. And he just goes on to something else. Okay, so he just brings up the drops, which is very interesting, um, probably because he really doesn't want to give it away, but he wants you to know that it's there. Um, Anyway, getting back to Second Ezra, then um, it says, um, "For your law was destroyed in the fire, and so no one can know about the deeds you have done or intend to do." Um, again, the fire being the trial, right? Do not be surprised by all these fiery trials that are that beset you or whatever, as it speaks of in the New Testament. Um, this is a metaphor for the um, the age. The age is one of a trial, one of a, you know, in a sense, the um, the fire, if you will, the fires of passion, the fires of the the war and the, of the spirit, um, and those trials. Um, it says, if I have one favor, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may write down the whole story of the world from the very beginning, everything that is contained in your law. Then men will have the chance to find the right path and, if they choose, gain life in the last days. So, in other words, the mystery is lost, but it's there in the law, encoded, right? Must be in parables, right? Okay. To be understood in the last days, right? And it says, go, he replied, call the people together and tell them not to look for you for 40 days. Have a large number of writing tablets ready and take with you Sariah and Dibri, uh, Shelemiah, Ethan, and Asiel, five men, all trained to write quickly. Then return here, and I will light a lamp of understanding in your mind, which will not go out until you have finished all that you are to write. When your work is complete, some of it you must make public, and the rest you must give to wise men to keep secret. Tomorrow, at this time, you shall begin to write. And I went as I was ordered and summoned all the people and said, Israel, listen to what I say. Our ancestors lived originally in Egypt as foreigners. They were rescued from that land and were given the law which offers life. But they disobeyed it, and you have followed their example. Then you were given a land of your own, the land of Zion. But you, like your ancestors, sinned and abandoned the way laid down for you by the Most High. Because he is a just judge, he took away from you in due time what he had given. And so you are now here in exile, and your understanding, um, I'm sorry, and your fellow countrymen are still farther away. And if then you will direct your understanding and instruct your mind, you shall be kept safe in life and meet with mercy after you die. For after death will come uh, the judgment. We shall be restored to life. And then the names of the just will be known and the deeds of the godless exposed. From this moment, no one must come to talk to me nor look for me for the next 40 days. I took with me the five men as I had been told. And we went away to the field and there we stayed. On the next day, I heard a voice calling me, which said, Ezra, open your mouth and drink what I will give you. So I opened my mouth and was handed a cup full of water, which uh, what seemed like water, except that its color was the color of fire. I took it and drank. And as soon as I had done so, my mind began to pour forth the flood of understanding and wisdom grew greater and greater within me. For I retained my memory unimpaired. I opened my mouth to speak and I continued to speak unceasingly. The Most High gave understanding to the five men who took turns at writing down what was said, using characters which they had not known before. And they remained at work through the forty days, writing all day and taking food only at night. But as for me, I spoke all through the day, even at night. I was not silent. In the forty days, ninety-four books were written. And at the end of the forty days, the Most High spoke to me. Make public the books you wrote first, he said, to be read by good and bad alike. But the last 70 books are to be kept back and given to none but the wise among your people. They contain a stream of understanding, a fountain of wisdom, a flood of knowledge. And I did so. Okay, so just do a little math here, right? What, what the, the, the canon 
that was eventually adopted um, later by the church, um, specifically the Protestants, was the, um, the canon of the 24, the Pharisaic canon, um, the 24 prophets. Um, because obviously 94 minus 70 is 24. So those 24, as it states in second Esther here, are for the good and the bad alike. So in other words, there, what he's telling you is that for a time, there are going to be the good and the bad, the worthy and the unworthy, the wise and the foolish, if you will, the weed and the tares, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, growing together, if you will, until the end of time. And these books are to be given us given back to us when, or the uh, laws to be restored when in the last days, right? So at the end of time. Well, okay, number one, um, that's that's the one place in the Old Testament, if you will, in the extended Old Testament, because you will find this in some King James versions. I don't know if they include this particular verse, but this is actually in, the second answer is in the King James version. Uh, and in the Gospel of Thomas, chapter 52, is the other place where the concept of the 24 is mentioned. Um, it says, let me see, we've got several definition, or different translations here. His disciples said to him, 24 prophets spoke in Israel, and they all spoke through you. He said to them, you have passed over him who is living in front of your eyes and have spoken of the dead. Now the question arises here. Having just read in the, um, the second book of Esther, that these 24 books, because again, there were 94 total, there were 70 to be held back, that leaves the 24. The 24 is indicative of the canon um, that was used by the Pharisees, the canon that was later uh, adopted by the Protestants. Um, but in any case, the number 24 mentioned here in, um, in Thomas, it sort of begs the question, when Jesus says, you have spoken of the dead, right? It's interesting that in 2 Ezra, the concept of the 24 is the concept of that which the good and the bad can agree upon. In other words, the good are unequally yoked with the bad because think about it if the 70 are held back for the wise among the people because they contain what does it say it says uh, make public the books you wrote first so the earlier ones are necessarily better than the later ones right uh, uh, he said to be read by good and bad alike but the last 70 books so just because they're later doesn't mean they're worse are to be kept back Right, and given to none but the wise among your people. So the ones who see the twenty-four, and not the seventy, right? They are not among the wise of the people, right? So what are what is the what is the connection here between the dead as Jesus speaks, right? Because the dead are not alive; they are not living. They 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 are not wise. In other words, they don't they don't understand that the concept of the twenty-four books is a dead concept. He says, "You have ignored the one living um, before you." Um, and in, and in fact, here's a couple of translations. One of them says, this is the last translation. He says, you have abandoned the one living before your eyes and spoken about the dead. A uh, Leighton translation, he says here, you have abandoned the one who is living in your presence and you have spoken of those who are dead. Right? Now, is he speaking of the prophets or is he speaking of the Pharisees? Right? Because the concept of the 24 is a Pharisaic concept. So that's interesting because those are the books that the good and the bad agree upon. Just, you know, just based on the straight out reading of these two books. I mean, you know, you can go look this stuff up. Um, but I just thought that was interesting to point out because going back to the book of Enoch, because if these last, these 70 books are to be held back until the last days, all right, to be given back to the people, right? Um, because they contain a stream of knowledge and a fountain of understanding and all that stuff, right? And they represent a significant departure from the concept of the canon. The canon is that which the good and the bad can agree upon. In other words, this is where, um, it's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like God says, look, there are good ones here and there are bad ones here, right? And he's going to sort them all out, of course. But this is kind of like a way in which to preserve the, um, the mystery for a later time. That things are couched in parables as it speaks of in Barnabas and he dares not go into it. Because apparently to do so, he claims that you wouldn't understand it. Um, but common sense would tell you, you don't explain parables. Uh, because parables are meant to conceal things. So anyway, um, and then, of course, at some later point to reveal them, that's the vehicle by which these mysteries are preserved. Although it's very, it's very obvious that um, he's speaking these things very openly and frankly to, uh, to Ezra here. Um, but again, nobody really takes that book seriously, so you know, it's not like they believe it or anything. But it, it can be shown anyway. This is the two places where the concepts of the 24 are spoken of. Both have this concept of death and of good and bad yoked together unequally. Um, so, 
having said that. And, um, oh, and, and the part about Jesus saying you abandoned the one in your presence, right? See, if, if Jesus isn't really down with this concept of the 24, right, if he's more in agreement with Ezra, right, well, when he says you've abandoned me, right, what it means is that, that Jesus is teaching something beyond just the 24. Um, and uh, this will bear itself out, of course, uh, as I go on. Um, Peter kind of alludes to this as well uh, in Second Peter. Um, but speaking of the words or the, um, the books that, have, um, that are for the wise among the people that contain a stream of understanding and a fountain of wisdom and a flood of knowledge, um, as I've stated before about the Book of Enoch, the Book of Enoch describes itself as being not for his generation, but for a future generation, which is for to come. Um, well, it starts out like this. The words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation, when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And um, let's see. Yeah, it says here, it's kind of for the same purposes. It says, um, and it says, um, you shall be kept safe in life and meet with mercy after you die. For after death will come the judgment. Um, and uh, Hebrews kind of alludes to that too. Um, we shall be restored to life. And then the names of the just will be known and the deeds of the godless exposed. So this is the deeds of the godless. This is also at the time when the wicked and the godless are to be removed, as it speaks of Enoch. Enoch is, in fact, one of these books. All of these books spoke of books being held back, mysteries being held back, understanding being held back, things being couched um, in parables that describe things present, as Barnabas speaks in 17.2, and things to come, right? So, in other words, if you're ever given this knowledge in the future, which it would make sense that you would be, right, because if things are preserved for a future generation, right, the time of the end, the time when wickedness basically reaches its conclusion, and if you're living here 2,000 years later, because another thing that the Epistle of Barnabas explains is that the six days of creation correspond to 6,000 years. Usher's chronology puts the creation at something like 4,004 BC. So if he's even halfway close on that, you know, we're pretty close to that time. And um, the chronology from Jesus kind of makes that even that much tighter. You know, if, if there's a firm 2,000 years there, give or take a few, we're right there. So we should be looking for these mysteries, right? But what they would be able to tell us is, if the future lies in parables, it means that looking back retrospectively, you will be able to see things that were couched that you didn't see, you didn't notice because you know how to read them. But now you look back, you're like, oh, that's what that meant, that's what that meant. And sure enough, that did happen, right? And so you see that, um, that these things actually did come to pass. And so the Bible actually proves itself to be prophetic. And in a day and age when people aren't thinking that or believing that or denying that, uh, not expecting it, to say the least, for you to be able to show this to them uh, is nothing short of miraculous. Well, I mean, it is miraculous. That's what it is. It's a miracle. It's, it's a wonder. It's a wonder of wonders. One of the other things that the Gospel of Thomas says, he says, look at the flesh came about because of the Spirit. It is a wonder, right? If the spiritual realities of the heavenly realm created this corresponding shadow of a material realm, and into this shadow it, it cast metaphoric meanings or whatever in, in the form of its word it borrowed from terminology like waves or these infiltrators of the church and the winds or doctrines and the leaven and teaching and it just it couched itself in ordinary terminology so it looks for all the world like you're just talking about common ordinary things right but you're not you're talking about heavenly things right and and then again this is this is so that the unbelievers and the atheists and stuff like that will have some it'll be grist for their little mill because they won't see that 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 you know, a famine might represent a famine of the word because it says that in one place in the Bible and it's supposed to be applied to every other place. But they don't do that. They don't think to do that because they don't give God credit for being even halfway intelligent. You know, so God, you know, uses their arrogance, their pride to sort of like, uh, you know, work around them. You know, he <laughs> he's certainly not intimidated by them. Um, this is okay. So this book is for, the book of Enoch, is for the day of tribulation when all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. So it serves that same, same function to show up the wicked and the godless at the end of time. Uh, it says he took up his parable, again, it's parabolic, even as part of the speaks of the future lying in parables. It says he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God. Um, again, Ezra was receiving straight from God, got it from a burning bush, same as Moses, right? It was, he was used as sort of an analogy for Moses. That's the same thing I'm doing for you. That was what was done for Moses, right? So just kind of give you an, an idea that all of this stuff about the works being preserved and everything goes all the way back to Moses, all the way back to Enoch. It always was the case. 
always has been the case, and now that it's the end of time, you can show that it was the case. And that's your strength, right? That's how you do it. If we do it, <laughs> we got to do it. Um, it says, okay, uh, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw, but not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come, concerning the elect, I said, and took up my parable concerning them. So in other words, um, what this book basically amounts to is it is to be held back until the time of the end. So what we normally conceive of is canon. Like when the, when the disciples come up to Jesus and say, oh, 24 prophets spoke in Israel and they all spoke in you, right? So what they have adopted is a canon because a canon is something that good and evil people can agree upon because they don't understand the spiritual meaning. They don't understand the parabolic aspects of it. They're not supposed to. The parabolic aspects are, are there to be revealed in retrospect. You saw the same thing happen in the New Testament where things were, you know, were spoken of in prospect. And then explain in retrospect. This is when Jesus was on, uh, uh, when the men were on their way back to Emmaus, and Jesus starts walking along with them, and he explains to them all that had happened in the Psalms and all the other stuff that pertained to him, right? He was speaking retrospectively. And when they understood, he's like, did our hearts not burn within us as we walked along the road, you know, and he, and he was made known to us through the breaking of the bread, you know, and, and all that. They were speaking, of course, retrospectively. Jesus was saying, look, all that stuff that you already know, all the stuff that you've been talking about, right, that was fulfilled. Let me show you how it was, right? And as soon as they saw it, man, he was gone. He was out of there, right? Um, <laughs> he was no longer really in the flesh at that point. Um, they saw, I mean, it, he... It was it was as if when they saw him in that in that sense, then he showed them by his his transcendence of the flesh by just disappearing, um, and that um, that the spiritual in a sense transcends the physical, the fleshly meaning or whatever. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of how the book of Enoch starts. But then there's the promise of the return of these books. Um, it says. Um, it speaks of two mysteries, and I, I touched on this in one of my previous videos, I know, but it says, okay, there are two basic mysteries that you got to know. There's the mystery of iniquity, and Paul speaks of this. There is, you know, the kingdom of death, the kingdom of darkness, kingdom of Babylon, wickedness, right? Basically, the satanic kingdom, whatever you want to call it, the great big conspiracy, all-time conspiracy, right? Um, and so now I know this mystery. Um, like Mystery Babylon, whatever, that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways, and will speak wicked words, and lie, and practice great deceits, and write books concerning their words. But when they write down truthfully all my words in their languages, and do not change or diminish aught from my words, but write them all down truthfully, all that I first testified concerning them, then I know another mystery, that books will be given to the righteous and the wise to become a cause of joy and of brightness and much wisdom, and to them shall the books be given, and they shall believe in them and rejoice over them. And then shall all the righteous who have learnt therefrom all the paths of brightness be recompensed. And uh, it continues in 105, it says, In those days the Lord bade them, that is to say the elect, who the book of Enoch was intended for, and also as Ezra speaks, these other 70 books, which, you know, they, they would correspond to the particular ones that he was given to narrate or whatever. It isn't to say that there couldn't be more of them, that others were inspired to write, but it's indicative of how these books are to be given after they are among the 70 or whatever. It says, in those days, the Lord bade them, that is the elect, to summon and testify to the children of earth, that is to say, those who lie under, if you will, an earthly understanding of these things, to take away, if you will, the flesh. Right, and to reveal to them the spiritual meaning of these things. Um, concern, um, children of the earth concerning their wisdom, show it to them, for you are their guides, and a recompense over the whole earth. For I and my son, and again Ezra mentions the son, will be united with them forever in the paths of uprightness in their lives, and ye shall have peace. Rejoice, ye children of uprightness. Amen. Okay, well, all of that would be fine and dandy, except for one thing. Well, all of this stuff is sort of, seems to be anyway, sort of peripheral to the canon that somebody may have come along and just sort of made all of this stuff up and they, it cannot be relied upon. And so that forms a sort of insurmountable barrier. Like, okay, so Ezra says this, so Thomas says this, or whoever wrote Thomas or whoever wrote Ezra said this, whoever wrote Enoch said this, you know, they all may have wanted it to happen. They all may have been on the same page. This may have been something that was going on just in the background or whatever, like a movement or a thought or, you know, whatever. But without some sort of process, without some sort of method to actually, um, to actually, uh, from within the canon, let's say, to actually um, tell us to do these things, right? Then none of that stuff will probably ever happen. But there have been ways in which um, we have been given to accomplish this goal of bringing these books back into Christian tradition and into um, the fold, if you will. 
Um, there are two basic major approaches to this, two really, really good ones that I can provide you with uh, just off the top of my head. Um, one would be just a simple fact that um, it is for every time that a New Testament writer, every time that a New Testament writer like, say, Paul alludes to a non-canonical book, being that in, in the book of Ezra, uh, second Ezra, the concept of the 24 is known and spoken of. Um, and in the Gospel of Thomas, which is supposed to be a very early gospel, um, the concept of the 24 books is known and spoken of. It is articulated. All right. It, it would seem rather strange that you would have someone like, say, Jude, quoting a book that was outside of those 24. Uh, why would they be at variance with um, what the disciples thought, you know, the 24 prophets had spoken in Israel? Or... Um, why they would be at variance with what the uh, congregation that is comprised of both good and bad, as Ezra speaks of. And just why it is that there would be, um, that people that wrote the New Testament would quote from extra canonical books. I don't want to say extra biblical, because the book of Enoch is not extra biblical. Remember what Ezra was saying was that, that just as Moses was told what to write and what to keep hidden, when you see the story of the fallen angels, for example, in Genesis chapter 6, 1 through 4, through that particular line of reasoning, the reason for the, the subject being brought up and then essentially dropped, uh, it, sort of, it sort of trickles on a little bit later. It says it also after that, right, when the sons of God came down and, you know, whatever the daughters of men, and you see these people persisting all the way really through um, the conquest of uh, Canaan, you know, um, the fallen angels in Sodom you know, Goliath, the giant, <laughs> right? These people still are around. Uh, but that Moses presumably could have utilized more of the book of Enon than he did, if this is to be believed, because as Moses was instructed before, so he was instructed in like fashion. So if Moses was told what to make public in the Lord's and what to, well, you know, to hold back or whatever, then he made that distinction. So you get this going all the way back. We shouldn't be surprised then to find this in the book of Enoch, that things would be held back until the time of the end. Um, now, um, beginning with the book of Jude. Um, the book of Jude, um, if seen through this light, and I'm not saying you have to. You can come to this conclusion the other way around. Um, but just, just to kind of make it easy for you. Taking that template and applying it to Jude, First off, explains why he's using the assumption of Moses. It explains why he's using the book of Enoch in addition to uh, Genesis and Exodus to, um, to, um, to uh, write against these people who are infiltrating his church. It starts out, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So these are the elect. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Um, again, you know, the elect, I guess, at the end of time or whatever, um, you know, that the mercy and whatever peace and love is, is bestowed upon them as it speaks of an Enoch, that they will have peace, in other words, in their time or whatever. Now, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, when you think about that particular sentence and the way it's structured, when he uses the word needful here, in other words, he's weighing two basic ideas, and he's using the word needful here. Basically, he's saying there is a necessity of the one entailed in the other. He had intended to speak to us of our common salvation. Um, but in order for him to, to even get to that point, it was needful for him to write unto us. And what is it that he's writing unto us about? He's exhorting us that we should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. There is a faith that was once delivered to the saints that we are to earnestly contend for. You have to fight for it. This is a mandate. This is an order from God. If you, if you will not obey his commandments, right, and, and do as he says, right, in other words, if you will not fight the good fight or whatever, um, then... I don't know what reward you can expect to receive for that. Uh, it certainly will not be for valiance or bravery or loyalty or anything like that. Uh, it says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. 
Um, now, one thing that Enoch and Ezra both had in common is that they spoke of the Son, right? The Son of God. Um, so they both spoke of that. Um, and also in Ezra, where it mentions the 24, the concept of the 24 books, they are for good and bad alike. Well, again, this, um, these people who have crept in have adopted this canon. Uh, maybe not that particular one. Um, you know, there, there was the, um, the extended um, canon that the Catholics and the Orthodox churches adopted that was a little bit broader than the 24. Uh, but by and large, they had a canon nonetheless. Um, and um, so, in other words, it, to to contrast the, the 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 people who rallied around the canon, Jesus calls them the dead, right? Those who have forsaken the one who is living before them. Why? Because Jesus rejected the concept of the twenty-four. So when they come at him with the concept of the twenty-four, he's telling them, "No, that is the teaching of the dead," right? And as Ezra would probably say, and would assert that Moses would say. Um, was that the concept of the 24 was a false concept, that there were the 24 that were, that were the common ground, if you will, that, of the good and the bad alike, but that they're truly wise or whatever had this extended canon, these extended books or whatever. And these are the things that Jude is telling us that we have to fight for. Um, so we do have the traces of this argument already as this book opens up. Uh, it says, I will therefore put you in remembrance. Again, there's that whole concept of things are concealed in prospect and revealed in retrospect. Barnabas tells us that the present things, like what's going on in Jude's church, concealed in parables, and future things, what will happen in the church afterwards, are also concealed in parables, something which we would not understand. And this is why it has been held back, so that in a sense we would not understand, so that these things could come to pass. Um, so we have to be put in remembrance, and that's another one of those ongoing themes that you see in Second Peter as well, the whole recollection theme. Um, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. In other words, that was an early teaching of the church. Again, Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas, you have abandoned the one who is living in your presence. Well, if Jesus was teaching beyond the concept of the 24, um, which again, Jude is teaching beyond the concept of the 24, by quoting the Assumption of Moses, by quoting the, uh, the Book of Enoch, and uh, as we just read in the Book of Enoch, you know, there are books to be given back to us. So there are books further still to come okay so um it says there's certain men um crept in unawares who before old were ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our lord jesus christ um and again these are these are cryptic references to when he says the lord god jesus speaks of god as the father um, this is with reference to the, the, the First Testament, if you will, as the law was that was given to Moses. Um, there are three basic testaments, one corresponding to the Father. The Father, in a sense, generates the New Testament by containing it prophetically and containing it in a concealed form, con uh, containing it in the form of parables, in the form of prophecies, in the form of you know things to come so that when Jesus does come all of those things that were spoken of in prophecy then get spoke then become fulfilled through his doings and through his actions or whatever okay it means that in a sense the old testament has sort of fathered if you will the new testament it means it means largely the same thing and this is why Jesus says greater things will you do because i go to the father right um that ye shall be called the sons of god so in other words Everything that Jesus did, we shall do likewise because why? Because he goes to the Father. In other words, there is that concept of the generative, if you will, that is still contained within the Word of God, that is still contained within the New Testament. There is revelation to come. There are new wineskins, if you will, for new wine. Um, and that we are them. We are the third grouping of people. Um, the third testament. There was the testament of the Father, the testament of the Son, and the testament to come of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always talking of, spoken of in future tense. Um, that when the comfort does come, it will lead you into all truth. Um, and, and all that. So it's spoken of in the future tense. Father is spoken of in past tense. My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Right? So in other words, it's sort of this transitional thing between what the father and his doings were and what the son, because the son does as the father does. He sees what the father does and does likewise. The testament of the father, if you will, contained the word of God within it. Um, fathered, if you will, by means of the Holy Spirit, the word through the body of scriptures, if you will, that were then present and came out in the form of the word of God, or in other words, metaphorically speaking, anyway, the New Testament was engendered. So when he says that they have denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, he's talking about those two testaments. 
that the first teaching, like Ezra, like Moses, was with regard to the 24 in the canon. Um, that there were uh, there were scriptures that people would agree upon, and then there were scriptures that were beyond that that the wise would read, and then that was where all the wisdom really was. Um, and you see that just from the sheer fact that I'm talking to you from these rejected books and showing you those things in them, and then taking all that stuff back in and plugging it into the scriptures that the good and bad, you know, both accept. That is to say, the canonical scriptures, and the pattern seems to bear itself out in those, and so. Um, through that means, we are given strength through that means of showing these things in what both the good, the congregation of the good and the congregation of the evil, what they both at least agree upon, at least in theory anyway, but they both seem to accept. Um, it, it puts them in a bind because, because at some point they either have to deny the word of God or they have to admit it. You know, and so, and so you can see where that... Um, where the judgment lies there, you know, God has drawn a line, if you will, in the sand, which side are you going to stand on? Um, because he is on the side of his word and his teaching. Um, but anyway, so when he says that they've denied the Lord God and they've denied the Lord Jesus Christ, all right, it means that this teaching was lost a second time. In other words, when, when the concept of the, um, when the concept of what the prophets said or what the prophets claim became um, subordinated to what other men said. For example, um, if it could be said, for example, in the Old Testament, you see it over and over again, where it says, if you want to read this, go read it in this book. If you want to, re if you want to find out more about this, is it not written in this book over here? Okay. In, in like fashion, it, it sort of implies that there were all these other books, like those 70 books that were held back, I guess, for the wise, um, that there were books that were outside of what was used in the synagogue or whatever. Um, that were read by the wise and that you could go and consult these books. But there were things that were to be made public and things which were to be concealed. And that was the teaching of the Old Testament. And so when Jesus comes along and he teaches the same thing, and again, that rebuke, when his disciples come up to him with the concept of the 24, when they come up to him with the concept of the canon, he speaks of them as the dead. Why? Well, I mean, who would be teaching both the wicked and the, and the, and the righteous? Who would be teaching both the good and the bad? Who would be teaching both the wheat and the tares? Obviously, for them to be doing that would mean that they were either subversives or they were ignorant. Right. But in either case, they're dead. Right. That's what Jesus is talking about there. The whole concept of the canon is bogus, but it's, it's in a sense, it's necessary because this stuff is to be held back until the end of time. The book of Enoch, for example, says that it's not for that generation, but for a future generation. And it is a parable. And so future things are held back in parables to be understood at the time in which those parables are understood. And then they can be explained pretty much straightforwardly. That's why he says, you know, I don't speak to you in parables anymore. Right. You know, and that day, you know, you will you will see me face to face. You understand. In other words, what I'm telling you, you'll get it, right? And that's what we need to do. We need to be teaching people in such a way that they get it, because you know, it's all right there. Um, again, it says, "I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believe not." Again, we're talking about Egypt again, um, just as we were in Ezra. Um, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Well, again, that's, that's an allusion to the book of Enoch, because the term chains is used in Enoch, I want to say, chapter 54. But chains is not used in the Old Testament in any place at all with regards to this. So we know there's kind of a smoking gun already in verse 6, because you can't show, it can't be demonstrated in the canonical scriptures where you see this, but you can see it in the book of Enoch. Um, so that's kind of a uh, that's just another sign. Uh, it says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh or set forth as an ex for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. And again, you have Egypt and Sodom, right, mentioned basically back to back here. Um, and you find a little bit later on in the book of Revelation, you see that where our Lord was crucified was spiritually speaking, in other words, in parabolic language, he's speaking of the city in which our Lord was killed, which is Jerusalem. Um, so, yeah, if all that stuff is to then be go, used and applied in that, those particular metaphors, then all of that escaping from Egypt, all of that stuff about Sodom and stuff is really about the church. It's really about Judaism in parabolic terminology and, as Revelation puts it, um, in spiritual language. Um, so, anyway, um, and the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Um, 
Yeah, as it applies to the religious institutions. <laughs> um, likewise, also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. So, in other words, there's at least... At least the part about where he says, the Lord rebuke thee, is a direct quote. You can write quotation marks around that. The rest of it may be descriptive, um, but it is still a reference to an apocryphal book. So when he starts out by saying, um, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. It should be getting clearer and clearer to you that if the book of Enoch is talking about books to be restored to us, if the second book of Ezra is talking to us about um, books that are to be revealed and books to be concealed until it's time to judge, if you will, the wicked, the godless people. If you see in the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus, in effect, rejecting the whole concept, the whole notion of the canon of the 24, uh, speaking uh, in the same sort of pejorative language about the 24 as it does in the only other place um, that it speaks of the 24, you know, that that those two things testify against the whole concept of the canon. It kind of begs the question, how do you read the canon? How do you know what books are reliable? Well, see, that's where, that's where the wisdom comes in. Instead of just drawing a circle around these books and saying these books are in, these books are out, um, it's like these are the books that we know we agree upon. And when these things are revealed, you will know based on their common language, you will know based on their parabolic language, in other words, what these books mean and what these other books over here that you rejected, they have the same interpretation. And therefore written by the same spirit and are therefore see and that's the way in which you can have and maintain an open canon is by having um, a common understanding of what these terms mean and it's laid out for you clearly enough in that they all use the same language and so you see it here you see it there you see it there there's no reason to question or to disagree with it because the the whole thing is about the totality of it and the agreement of it and the harmony within it and um, the mind that sort of lies behind that the spirit that lies behind that um, and it says but these, this is in verse 10, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but which they know naturally, as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Well, he, he's just gotten through using, um, he's, he's just gotten through alluding to chains as is spoken of in Enoch and not in Genesis, but just pretending for a minute that Jude just sort of lost you know, side of what he was thinking, and maybe he got those two verses confused in his head or something like that. Uh, he uses an apocryphal book. He says, yeah, Michael the archangel will continue with the double dispute about the body of Moses, right? So when he then follows that particular apocryphal, pseudepigraphal statement, one which flies in the face of the concept of the 24, which has been established that the 24 was a teaching from around that time. Um, when the Gospel of Thomas was written, for example, that concept must have been floating around in order for that to have been recorded there in saying 52. It says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. Well, what don't they know? Well, they don't know about these other books that were held back until the end. They don't understand the book of Enoch. They don't understand the significance of the, the assumption of Moses. They don't get the secret language. They don't understand parables. And Barnabas isn't going to explain it, right? Maybe there's a reason why, you know. Um, maybe there were people out there who would stop at nothing. I mean, literally nothing to make sure that these things could not be known and transmitted. Even if it took an entire dark age to do it, right? You would stop this from being known. You would control all the information. You would control everything until this was completely anathematized, until it was completely wiped out, until nobody anywhere knew any of this stuff. And then you could serve your Lord and Master Satan for the full 2,000 years. Um, it says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Again, uh, ran greedily after the arrow of Balaam, the false prophet for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah, the rebellion against God. So these people that have crept into the church are comparable to what? To Cain, who slew Abel, his brother. These people who have infiltrated the church can be compared to to Balaam, who for money, you know, um, <laughs> uh, cursed the children, brought a curse down upon the children of Israel, a temptation, um, and, in the, and, 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 and comparable to the rebellion of Korah, right? Um, that's pretty heavy duty stuff. These people are still around, right? Well, they, the people then didn't like the assumption of Moses. The people then didn't like the book of Enoch. The people now don't like the assumption of Moses. The people now don't like the book of Enoch, right? Um, I, I, I would be willing to bet money if you came up to them and said, here, look, but Jude likes them. Jude believes them, right? Why aren't we in agreement with Jude, right? They would have a hundred million reasons why, you know, not to believe Jude or whatever. But the truth of the matter is that that they testify against themselves in that they are not believers. Um, they, 
you know, they, they question the prophets. And you're put in a strong position in that you don't have to question it. You don't have to doubt it. You don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to come up with excuses why Jude is wrong. You just, you just, you say that he's right and you show that he's right. Um, it says, these are spots in your feasts of charity. Uh, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Well, again, why are they twice dead? Well, because the church made itself, it did the same thing as, as Judaism did before, in that they had the 24 books, right, in order to, because, because what it was was like this. There are things that the carnal mind finds palatable. And there are things that the carnal mind does not find palatable, right? Uh, the carnal mind doesn't like stories, even if they're parables that don't jive with history or don't jive with, you know, reality as we understand it. We don't like things that go too far afield. You know, we don't like things that stretch our credulity. We don't have the concept of what a parable really might mean or might entail. We're very literal, right? And so because of that, um, the, the, the kinds of things that um, true believers can swallow, um, as opposed to the your average person off the street or whatever, that um, because of the, con the, the spirit, I guess, of compromise, of concord, of, you know, can't we all just get along or whatever, things kind of just narrow the, down to whatever it is that the people feel comfortable with as a whole. And, you know, whatever the truth of the matter actually may be just becomes sort of a more peripheral matter. It becomes a little more you know, um, academic, I suppose, and what people's agreements uh, are um, become what prevails. And, and this is this is very easily demonstrated. I mean, how many different churches are there? And how many different belief systems do they have? You know, people who go to this church or whatever, they more or less, you know, toe the line. They more or less, you know, say and do and act and whatever believe as they are told. And to whatever extent they don't, they generally, you know, toe the line anyway, just not to make ways or whatever. You know, but for what it's worth, you know, they're 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 because of people's agreements or whatever. You know, the truth gets lost in all that, um, and so you know they're twice dead, dead in the sense that Judaism adopted that canon in twenty four, and Christianity adopted that same canon, so that both religions in a way lost out on what might have been you know the truth, but it was destined to happen. There was no way around it. Um, plucked up by the roots. In other words, the whole thing goes, right? There's nothing left of it. It just, there's no foundation. There's no roots. There's no anything behind it, really. It's all contrived. Uh, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Well, again, the, um, the, the wandering stars and the blackness of darkness or whatever, these are all allusions to the book of Enoch. Uh, I want to say it's 18, 24, and 108, there is an object described, which I contend is a black hole, but, and because there are stars orbiting around, there are only so many things that stars can actually orbit around, you know, in space, and this is beyond the great earth, as it speaks of. In any case, um, but again, speaking of parables, like the raging waves, um, how it speaks of, they're carried about by winds, Paul speaks of winds of doctrine, Enoch speaks of winds in terms of, you know, um, that there are reservoirs, if you will, of the winds. It also speaks of itself as a parable. Um, reservoirs of the winds would be like reservoirs of doctrines. And um, that they are clouds without water. Water is the word, right? That we that the church will um, be cleansed with the washing of water by the word, right? So their water and word are used interchangeably. Um, winds of doctrine, uh, those are used interchangeably. Winds are doctrines, right? So they're blown about by doctrines. Um, they're clouds or crowds, if you will, um, like it says, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Anytime you see a um, metaphor or a simile, um, you know, those two words are associated. A cloud of witnesses means a cloud is witnesses. Um, so they are, if you will, witnesses without water or they don't have a word with them, which is apt in that they only have these 24 books or whatever, um, as opposed to the, you know, the set of the 24 plus the 70 or however many are beyond that. Um, and um, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackest of darkness. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, execute judgment upon all, and to convince all their ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Well, that's quite a mouthful. You know, um, the way in which he uses that is he cites the source, Enoch, he includes it. Uh, among the sources that he's using against these people, among which are the uh, pseudepigraphal assumption of Moses or some other book, if it's not that one, because that's kind of uh, the, the traditional explanation of what that book is. 
Um, but we, it's no longer extant, at least not fully extant, so we can't prove it. But in any case, it's not an Old Testament book, so we know that much. Um, and of course, there's Genesis and Exodus that he's quoting there um, as well. But he's listing Enoch um, in terms of the, the sources that he can use to cite against these people. So he cites what may be two canonical sources and then what are definitely two apocryphal or pseudepigraphal sources against these people. So Enoch, in his mind, also can be used against them. So yeah, Enoch also, right? Um, and then it says the seventh from Adam, right? So that establishes his um, his antediluvian origin. If he is the seventh from Adam, then this book, or at least this prophecy, um, came to us from before the time of the flood, which the book of Enoch itself explains to us that Enoch himself was a scribe. So himself being a scribe, um, you know, these, this book was most likely in written form. And it also contains fragments, sections really from Noah, um, the epistle or the book of Noah. Um, and um, it says, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own laws, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which are spoken of before, of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who would walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, not having the spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Um, so, so what he's telling you is that these people have left the authentic tradition that was set forth by the apostles of our Lord. Um, that they went out from them, as it speaks of in um, in um, First John. They went out from us, but they were not of us, right? So they can be shown. Why? Well, what it means is they left that tradition. They left that um, that authentic teaching, and it is perfectly demonstrable. I mean, the fact that the fact that Paul quotes, say, the wisdom of Solomon, the whole armor of God imagery, right? Christians are very dishonest about that one. Um, even even Protestant ministers understand that this comes from the wisdom of Solomon. It's easily demonstrated that Ephesians 6 borrows almost entirely from the wisdom of Solomon chapter 5, right? But again, it goes along with the whole dishonesty thing. See, if you, if you maintain a tradition such as the wisdom of Solomon is bogus, for whatever reason, apocryphal, whatever, inferior, the fact is Paul didn't feel that way, but you do. Paul's not afraid to use that imagery. Uh, you know, most Protestant preachers would dare to, to quote even one verse out of that book in church, even if it really, really bolstered their, their teaching, they wouldn't use it just on principle. But that's not as Paul thought, and that's not as he taught, um, or that Satan himself, you know, manifests himself as an angel of light, that being from the life of Adam and Eve. But that's not what our theologians believe. This is not what our ministers teach. It's just as a demonstrable fact. They just don't teach and believe the same way in which the writers of the New Testament and the apostles themselves believe. And this should really be troubling to people. But like I said before, because of the way people tend to be, they like the idea of agreement and they're used to it. I mean, people ask you, what denomination are you? What denomination are you? Are you this? Are you uh, Episcopalian? Are you Catholic? Are you Jehovah's Witness? What? I mean, then people ask you, like, what religion do you belong to, right? Well, it just by automatically, because a religion is a man-made thing, it's sort of a contrivance. I mean, it may be people who are genuinely seeking the truth. I mean, I'm not suggesting that it's inherently dishonest in the sense that these are actual wicked people trying to deceive you. They may well be trying to find the truth, but the thing about it is the truth is being held back until the last day. This is, um, Corinthians just nothing until that day, right? You know, when that day will reveal it, right? So until then, it's all just kind of like let everybody, you know, do according to their own conception, right? Because it's not going to do any good. You know, you'll, you'll never get it until it's time to be gotten, if you will. And that, just, that time just has not yet come. But when it starts to be as it was in the days of Noah, and when you start to see the fruit, you know, when you see the trees, if you will, put forth the leaves, if you will, that uh, the leaves of the trees, if you will, uh, that summer is not, well, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations, as it speaks of. The elect are the trees. Um, who bear the fruit. 
And, um, you know, the fig tree, the Jews that didn't bear the figs yet, it wasn't season yet. It just wasn't time yet. And so Jesus had to curse it. And then um, the following one, the following day, it's cast as immediately. And then it's also cast in another book as the next day to indicate that it's it's killed in a sense a second time. You know, um, it, uh, um, it, it dies in a sense immediately because Jesus is there to curse it if you will rebuke it. But then it sort of dies a second time, too, because in a sense, it just reverts back to its old ways. So Jesus corrects it, if you will. And it, it's analogous to the um, the beast if it was, uh, that was killed, whose one of its head was uh, cut off by the sword or the word of God. In other words, that in other words, there was a period where the mystery was known, and then it was subsequently suppressed by the Jews. As the Jews represents people who knew where the logos was, and gave it over to the religious and secular authorities. That, in the language of parables, anyway, that functions as the in parabolic terms, anyway, how you can see just what it was that the um, that the early Jews, the early Antichrist, the Diotrephes, if you will, the um, Hymenaeuses, if you will, the Nicolaitans, if you will, um, the Jezebels, if you will, you know, did to the early church um, to subvert the mystery, to subvert it to the level of the flesh, right? Um, to cut out the higher meaning, the parabolic meaning or whatever, so that it would not be known, and then they could dominate you know, the, wicked, the, the kingdom of heaven, we could take it by force, right? That um, the like vultures gathered around the carcass, if you will, you know, um, that, you know, that for these 2,000 years that we are to be dominated because if the day is to reveal it, it means that what, until we reach that day, it's just, it's not revealed. <laughs> I mean, it's just straight up, that's what that means. But anyway, what's significant about all of this is that, um, Second Peter, um, interestingly enough, takes this book of Jude, and for some reason or other, it's, it's a little unclear as to just what the process was. Since, um, since, his, since his letter provides us with certain kinds of answers and certain kinds of information, it can be uh, inferred from an answer, let's say, just what the question is, or at least what the, the writer of that answer, the answerer, if you will, would have his audience or his reader under to understand uh, so as to uh, disabuse them, let's say, of some misunderstanding. So either he intuits that they understand this wrong or somehow they're vocalizing or it's being expressed or whatever. But um, since he answers the questions of like no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, it means that there's a set interpretation. So apparently there was some question as to whether there was a set interpretation or perhaps just what would what the set interpretation, if you will, was. And also the credibility, if you will, of the prophetic writers uh, is also addressed. Um, it says in, let's see. Yeah, knowing this verse, this is um, 1 Peter or 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. It says, knowing this verse, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Um, so he wants people not to think that they can just interpret it any way they want. Um, that there's apparently something agreed upon, in other words. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that answers several questions as to legitimacy of something. In other words, is it written by the Holy Ghost? Yes, they spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, right? Did it come by the will of man? No, prophecy came not in the old in old time by the will of man. Is it prophecy? Yeah, the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, right? Were these men holy? Holy men of God spake. So all the all the information that he's providing answers basically those questions. Were they holy? Yes, they were holy. Were they ancient? Yes, they were whole time. Were they prophetic? Yeah, prophecy came. Were they mind inspired by the Holy Spirit? Yes, you know. So all of these things he's affirming. Um, what's interesting is how those questions correspond to Jude and his assertions about the book of Enoch. For example, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam. Um, he's asserting that Enoch is old. And one of the questions that Peter answers here is, that they came not in old time by the will of man. So in other words, if there's some connection here, and I'm not saying necessarily that there is, but he takes almost all of Jude and writes around it, you know, and the second chapter of Second Peter is devoted to Jude, so it cannot be said that Jude was not somewhere in his thinking when he was writing this, right? And the fact that he leaves out the Enoch quote specifically, but seems to echo all of the um, statements in Jude's introduction. In other words, Enoch also the seventh round of prophesied. Is he a prophet, in other words? Well, it says here, for prophecy. So you see that same word, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Was he the seventh from Adam? Yeah, old time, right? By the will of man, was he genuinely inspired, right? Well, it wasn't the will of man, but it was he was a holy man of God that was moved by the Holy Ghost, right? So, in other words, 
could this holy man have been Enoch? Could this holy these holy men could they have been the writers of the uh, Assumption of Moses? Could they further then be construed as the writers of these other books as well? There, because Jude makes assertions of Enoch's prophetic nature, and Peter here brings up the topic of prophecy. That's an interesting. That's an interesting. Um, question. And because the antiquity is mentioned by Jude that he was the seventh from Adam, it's interesting that Peter would, would use the term old time. Um, because the nature of Enoch was that it was outside of the 24 and it's been established that the 24 is a known, um, uh, a known term that referred to the canon as it was accepted, um, at least by the religious establishment of the day, um, there would have been questions as to whether this was written by man or written by God. And so for Peter to use the will of, not the will of man, but that they were holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Well, this kind of answer wouldn't really apply to anything that was accepted. Let's say that, let's say that he was referring to the 24 here, you know, um, um, the, the, the works of Moses and Joshua and Judges and Ruth and, you know, David and Solomon and all these other prophets, right? I, I can't see where, number one, there would be any question of those things to begin with. And number two, in the context of this letter, since he focuses almost entirely around the book of Jude, really almost to the exclusion of anything else specific, um, except towards the end, um, you know, uh, that, that kind of just about ices it. It really nails it down. A lot of what Jude said in bringing up the Enoch quote is echoed in um, 2 Peter 1.21. So a lot of the same terminology comes up there. So that, that provides an interesting template, especially since he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Well, Enoch calls itself a parable. So it should be understood, at least in terms of prophetic and parabolic terms, which if this is with reference to that particular section of Jude, then it makes sense why then he goes immediately into Jude and why he says you have to know this first. Right. Why that, of all things, is the most important thing you need to know is the antiquity of these things, the inspired nature of these things, the prophetic nature of these things, that they did not come from the mind of men. It sounds a whole lot like he's talking about books that were in dispute and not books that were accepted. Right. It makes a whole lot of sense when after you go through his second chapter where, for instance, in in Second Peter two eleven, he makes that same general allusion to the assumption of Moses. He says, "Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not really an accusation against them against them before the Lord." That corresponds with um, Jude nine. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. It's a little more specific in Jude because he mentions Moses. He men he gives the, the angel a name. In fact, he gives the title Michael the archangel rather than just angels in general. So. It looks for all the world like Peter is sort of watering Jude down, like Jude is getting all carried away with this and being all specific and stuff. And Peter's at least saying, well, you know, it's kind of true, but, you know, whatever. It's just, it seems like he's watering it down, but I, that's not what he's really doing. Because he understood, number one, that Enoch was not for his generation, but for a remote one, as Jude did. He can't answer like, oh, is this book of Enoch good or not? Because that's not a question of whether the book is inspired or not. In fact, he answers that question. He says that they were moved by the Holy Spirit, that they were ancient men, that they were prophetic, and that the, they moved as they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. So he basically does answer that question. He just leaves out exactly what that pertains to. He leaves it a little ambiguous, right? Because, again, it is given to Peter that whatever he binds on earth, in other words, in earthly terminology, um, as this letter does, it gives these people enough rope to hang themselves because they can argue it the other way. They can say well, Peter seems to be watering Jude down. Jude seems to be talking about the book of, of Enoch and the Assumption of Moses or whatever in particular, whereas Peter seems to be speaking of it in great, broad, sweeping generalities, and in some cases he seems to be avoiding the subject. So you look at it in terms of scholarship and you say, look, he's watering it down. He's making it more you know, palatable and acceptable, if you will, to those people who may have had objections to it. Uh, but it may also well just be that um, he knows that people will jump to that conclusion and um, he's sort of giving them enough rope to hang themselves. Uh, one of the first things I did when um, I became interested uh, in the concept of this relationship between Second Peter and Jude, see, a couple of things just really bothered me about what the people did with the canon. I never liked the way the canon was set up, first off. First of all, um, I think that, that there are a couple of things. I mean, I understand why they did it in, in some regards. I mean, politics kind of plays into it a little bit. Um, it, you know, I, I always kind of imagine that the, the, the New Testament should have started with John because it's sort of like in the beginning, right, was the word. And the word, it sort of mirrors, um, you know, it sort of mirrors the, um, 
the whole Genesis thing away. So it's kind of like a whole other creation story. Uh, but since, you know, Revelation kind of ended the Bible, it probably seemed a little unfair to, uh, to start out with John and end up with John. You know, that put probably a little too much weight on John. And besides, the way it starts out with Matthew, of course, it, you know, it emphasizes his genealogy, you know, who he is. It establishes his ethos as a man. But, of course, John establishes him as the Word or the Logos. And consequently, what that did was, um, because Matthew and Luke are so similar, it seems to me like Matthew and Luke should be sort of butted up against each other. And because Luke and Acts are basically two parts of the same work, it, it should follow that Luke and Acts should be together. You should have, therefore, um, John, you know, beginning and ending the New Testament, if you will, uh, with sort of the creation and with the ending, if you will. Um, that that forms a kind of, you know, like bookends, if you will. And that it kind of leaves Mark out, but in a way, Mark and Luke sort of, or Luke and uh, Matthew sort of borrow, if you will, from Mark, um, you know, so that it would probably make more sense to go John, then Mark, then Matthew, then Luke, and then Acts. And then probably Galatians, if it's the earlier writing, you see a lot of historical references in Galatians to like the Council of Jerusalem and stuff like that. that you really don't see in later writings. Uh, may not be the earliest writing, but in any case, you know, putting putting Paul aside because there's a little too much uncertainty there really to uh, to really bear that out. Uh, I think James kind of nicely fits where it is following Hebrews, um, probably as does First Peter, um, and Second Peter probably obviously should go next to First Peter, um, but then it really should be followed by Jude for two basic reasons. Uh, number one. Um, that uh, the Second Peter and Jude, um, there's a relationship between these two books, and to separate them uh, sort of hides this a little bit in people's eyes. And in addition to that, by inserting Jude between Third Peter and Revelation, you kind of lose a little bit of your momentum. If you're reading First and Second and Third John, by the time you get all the way down to Third John, you see you see John the Elder so alienated from some of the congregations of the church. And uh, you see how people have already begun infiltrating that church. And uh, Diotrephes, for example, is spoken of by name, one who loves to have the preeminence. He will not only not accept John, the beloved apostle, you know, into his church or whatever, but any of his followers either. You know, and then you see John, you know, you see the rest of John's sort of biography there where he gets exiled to Padmos going into Revelation. There is some point of contact, though, with Revelation and Jude. And consequently, Second Peter, though, where I can kind of see why you put Jude there. You know, he speaks of the land. There's that common element. He speaks of Sodom and Egypt. There's that. Uh, he speaks of the morning star that he's going to give us. That's a point of contact with Second Peter. Um, you know, so just the ordering of the canon doesn't solve every problem that there is. It doesn't, you know, there may not be a right answer or a best answer even. But the way in which the canon is sort of is put together now, you know, it 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 it, it, it sort of creates a it sort of creates a problem in that, for example, Jude and Second Peter uh, were meant to be read together and understood together. One of the first things I did when I started putting these ideas together in my head is I just sort of made a hybrid text. And you no, know, I didn't get a D on it. <laughs> I think I had like recensions A, B, C, and then I finally ended up with this one. But in any case, um, what these colors represent anyway is, uh, okay, I went ahead and I used um, blue to denote that which is more or less exclusively in Jude. And all this yellow down here is that which is more or less explicitly in Second Peter. And then what I did was I used the green here, the green sections here, to highlight similarities, like similar sections between Jude, because yellow and blue, so you make green, right? <laughs> so these kind of are common sections with one another. So when you see, like, for instance, here, you see sort of, you know, similar paraphrase, the similarity in phraseology between Second Peter and Jude. There's a connection there. And then there's sort of a logical progression here where um, Second Peter adds a little, Jude sort of adds a little to the whole picture, and then you have similar sections here where they kind of meet up again, and then Second Peter kind of carries on the thought, and that was just prior to, I guess, taking the whole thing and putting it together, but this is kind of like, you know, the impetus behind, well, how am I going to arrange this, how am I going to block this out, you know, and here you see maybe fewer points of contact, but they're still there, and they, they more or less follow each other structurally throughout. Um, 
and you can read those sections. What I decided was I was reading those sections side by side, and that was kind of what I was seeing. Is, it, is, is Jude kind of getting at the same thing that Peter's kind of getting at? So I kind of made a little hybrid letter, and then I compared sections, this section with this section, and then I finally ended up just wholly integrating both books 100% after I had reached that particular point. So I guess that would be recension F. But in any case, um, the, <laughs> the idea was to try and see what putting those two things together would do. Um, and it's interesting enough to do, uh, it really gives you all the pieces all in one nice big, you know, um, uh, orderly, you know, sensible kind of, you know, um, it's just easy to read that way. But of course, some of that's arbitrary. Um, and also, um, it may not be just exactly the, um, the way in which to accomplish the reintroduction, if you will, of the Book of Enoch. It may not be the actual line of reasoning that you follow in order to accomplish that. What what you find is as you as you as you as you get towards the end of the second chapter of Second Peter, which almost entirely follows Jude. That's kind of like this whole green area down here. That's where Second Peter and Jude share a lot of common phraseology, a lot of common sentence structure and syntax, and that's what all that green represents. These are points of contact, really, between those two books. Now, in any case, having said all that, I'm not going to go through then all the trouble of uh, trying to explain to you all the parallels between those two books because this is already taking long enough as it is, and besides, it's just something you can look into on your own. But just to kind of uh, just to kind of pick up after the Jude material, what is it that what is it that Peter says about these people um, when he starts transitioning back away from Jude and into his own uh, own letter? Here it says, "But it happened unto them that is to say, the infiltrators of the church." According to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Now, what's interesting is, now he has, before he goes into the Jude material, he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, is he speaking of apocryphal books as being holy? Um, is he speaking of these writers as being ancient and inspired? The reason I say this is because not only does he here in the Jude material here here in um, in Second Peter two eleven, not only does he refer to the assumption of Moses, albeit in a somewhat watered down form, when he concludes um, chapter two here, um, he concludes it with a very strange saying here. He says it has happened unto them, that is to say, the people who Jude is using apocryphal books against. And he kind of is using apocryphal books against, I mean, he's using Jude against them, and he's including the assumption of Moses here. But what's interesting here is the juxtaposition. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, and it's, a, it's in singular form, a true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and that the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Well, see, one of those is from the, um, the Old Testament, um, the book of Proverbs, and the other one is from the story of Ahikar, chapter 7, verse 27, where it says, O my son, thou hast been to me like the pig who went into the hot bath with people of quality, and when it came out of the hot bath, it saw a filthy hole and went down and wallowed in it. Now, you don't really have to read too hard between the lines here to understand what he's telling you. You see, Jude is using apocryphal books alongside canonical books. He's using the Assumption of Moses alongside Genesis. He's using the Book of Enoch alongside, um, say, Exodus or whatever. Okay, And Peter is defending Jude by writing around his book. He's using all the same words in prefacing the Jude material as Jude uses to preface the Enoch quote, such as Jude uses the word prophesied of these men, and Peter says um, that prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Right, um, Jude calls Enoch the seventh from Adam, and again, as I said before, Peter says that men in old time, um, the prophecy came not in old time, like the seventh from Adam, for example, or the time of Moses when the assumption of Moses may have been, you know, written or whatever, uh, or somewhere thereabouts. Right. So the entire concept here is that um, that the Peter is using very similar terms as Jude is using towards the Book of Enoch, and then he caps it all up by combining if you will, juxtaposing the canonical alongside the apocryphal and using the term the true proper. According to them, it has happened according to this. So in other words, it has happened uh, to them 
according to the true, true proverb, and it describes like what it is they're doing. The dog is returning to its so vomit, of course, being its theology. And the sow, once washed, goes back to her wallowing in the mire. Again, this is the mystery then being known. In other words, it's washed by what, of course, water. The water is the word, the washing of water by the word, right, as Paul speaks of. So the sow then is washed, and it goes back to its wallowing in the mire. But that being a quote from a pseudepigraphal book, just like Jude is quoting from the pseudepigraphal books of the Assumption of Moses and the Book of Enoch, here we have Peter also quoting from pseudepigraphal books. So it is defending Jude, is answering questions that have to do with the prophetic nature of certain books, which would have been in question, of course, in the book of Jude, and whether they are aged or not, it speaks to that. Um, and here it is that he uh, combines, an, uh, he, he combines a, a canonical proverb with a pseudepigraphal proverb as one proverb. It just happened to them according to the true proverb. So in other words, if we see Peter condoning the use of these books, if we see Peter defending Jude, if we see Peter not excluding the assumption of Moses, quote, even in, in the sense that he may be appearing to water it down, the fact that he caps it all off with an explicit quote of his own to a, a pseudepigraphal book that was obviously rejected kind of ices it. It tells you exactly where he's coming from. He's saying, I'm reading these apocryphal books, just like Jews read these apocryphal books. Are you reading these apocryphal books? Right? Is this what they're teaching you in the churches? See, because these are the things that we know now and are firmly established in now. But it's not something that we know now in our day and time. It's not something that we are firmly established in. And that is because we were supposed to fight for these books, which we didn't do. Or at least uh, we didn't prevail. Um, but in our day, in our time, we are supposed to fight for these books, and we are supposed to prevail. It says in the, at the end of the book of Enoch that we are to show the people of the world, and this provides us with the means by which to do this. And um, Peter continues, beginning with uh, chapter 3, it says, In the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. In other words, we're going to forget, so it's a reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. All right? Um, so there are holy prophets that we have forgotten, right? And of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. See, this is where, this is where you start to see the connection. Because Peter is doing this. He's saying, look, I understand what the book of Enoch says. It's not for his generation, but for a remote one, which is for a come. Somebody comes up to me and asks me if this book is inspired or not. Yeah, I'm going to tell them it's inspired, right? But I also know it's not for our generation, right? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it to where you can you can learn that you can remember this in due time when you were supposed to remember, because there is a day and there is a time when you are supposed to remember these things, just isn't now. So I have to plant the seed. I have to make sure that even though the mystery is going to be lost over time, that it is recoverable. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a line here between what I've just now said. I've just I've just I've just told you first of all you have to understand that these books are prophecy that there that they there is an interpretation to them and it's not private it's not subject to you and what other people think it's, it's determined you know um, there are set rules there's a set interpretation in other words um, that you can't go too far afield from or else you'll lose it you know and um, that these books are ancient and prophetic right that's what you have to understand first of all and now I'm going to go into all this Jewish material I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to run parallel to Jew for a while. So you just you get the idea that I'm defending this book. And then I'm going to cap it all off with the juxtaposition of an apocryphal and a canonical quote, all under the aegis of one proverb, and I'm going to use it against these men. All right? Now, if you read between the lines here, you're understanding what he's doing from a structural standpoint. So when people are going to look for you know, um, their explanations of just what it is that Peter's saying, you can't escape the structural aspect of it. That's something you can't weasel your way out of logically, because why logically would you do that? What's the, what's the reason why he would structure it that way? Why would he do that? He had to have been aware of what he was doing. And even if he wasn't, you certainly have to be, uh, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit was aware of what it was saying, right? You just can't read a lot of it. It's just, it's there. Um, and so he's, he's drawn a line. He said, these were spoken by the Holy Prophets, right? Like what? Like the Assumption of Moses? Like the story of Akikar? Like the Book of Enoch? And as the Book of Enoch states that other books will be given back to us, right? As Jude iterates that, that we are to fight for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints, Right? And these men who have crept in in his day did not accept those books, and they still don't accept those books to this day. That's, that's the point of contact there. That's how you know that it's a smoking gun. That's, that's how you know they won't accept them, they don't accept them. Right? But because you believe the Word of God, because you believe his prophets, you have to. You have really are given a choice. These things are, are there, they are inherent in the scriptures. The features do exist, and these things are verifiable. 
and so not to or not to countenance their existence and uh, not to do your due diligence and to look these things up you know and to see them for yourselves and to affirm the reality of that is sort of the trail of God's word and the trail of his truth and this is how the lie perpetuates itself and what you do what you got to do is you just got to cut that short and say nope so you can't be lies just straight up that is it and um, that's the answer you know, there's just there's just no way out of this argument. This argument is ironclad, and time has borne it out. Um, it says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. But this they are willingly ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that was then, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are being kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So you see what's happened here? Water, 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 work. Right? It says, by the same word of, by that word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Um, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, that is to say the water of the word, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, that is to say the upper meaning and the lower meaning, um, by the same word are kept in store, or in a sense by the same waters, in other words, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, again, a day is as a thousand years, a thousand years, or it's a day. We speak of um, the day dawning, if you will, in the morning star rising in your hearts. He speaks of that later. Um, the day as a thousand years and a thousand years or as a day uh, speaks of in uh, the Revelation of John about there being a thousand year millennium. That that is the day, if you will, the Sabbath day, if you will. And Barnabas explains that thoroughly in his epistle. Um, and it says, The day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the element shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burnt up. Um, uh, again, Paul speaks of our works to be burnt up or whatever. Um, seeing that all of these things shall, that all of these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and in godliness? Um, and all of this burning and the elements and everything that's also also spoken of the apocalypse of Peter. So there's similar phraseology there. So they, you know, that's uh, that's further evidence that these are penned by the same hand, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. That day of a thousand years, that thousand year day, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. The heavens, of course, that um, are now are dominated by the watchers or the archons or the rulers, the, the wickedness in high places. Those are the quote unquote heavens that are there and those are going to pass away. Um, those shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth. In other words, um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? Wherein dwelleth righteousness, that is to say, his will be done, not ours. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace, without spot, and blameless. Um, and that similar phraseology to Jude as well. And on account of that, uh, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, um, there's another point of contact with Jude. Because Jude starts out speaking of our common salvation, really as opposed to our individual salvation. The devil's got us focusing on the, ourselves and the ego, so everybody thinks in terms of their individual salvation rather than our common salvation, which would involve all of us being out here. You know, you know, when, unless and until you start seeing everybody else's fate, if you will, everybody else's destiny as, as bound up with yours, um, we're not going anywhere. Um, but just as it speaks of in Jude, it says, um, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints. So that being all of these apocryphal books, like, again, the Assumption of Moses, like the Book of Enoch, like as we just read in Second Peter, the story of Ahikar 727, um, and again, as we are about to see, Paul also is given... Um, this is this particular um, this particular tendency is also imputed to Paul, if you will, um, 
like it says here, an account of the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That, in other words, the long suffering of our Lord being salvation, and Jude speaking of our common salvation and being predicated on um, our fighting for this faith, it means it's going to take a long time for this faith to come around, really 2,000 years. It says, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things. Well, here again, what are these things? Well, in, in Jude, when he speaks of fight for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, what is Paul speaking of? The faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints as well. It's these same things, right? The same things that Peter is telling you, right? Paul wants to restore this stuff to us as well. The problem is he understood there was a problem. The way you know this is because, first of all, when you read in Ephesians, right, when you read about the... Um, well, here. If you read in Ephesians um, about the armor of God, here we go. Yeah, um, starting with verse ten. This is chapter six, verse ten. It says, "Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil." Now, bear in mind, this is coming from the Wisdom of Solomon, chapter five. This imagery: "For we wrestle not against flesh and blood." but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Um, stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, first of all, if you deny that this is coming from the wisdom of Solomon, as Paul is quoting this book, then you cannot say that you have your loins girt about with truth. What you actually have your loins girt about with, in actual fact, is falsehood. Because this, this is your falsehood that you perpetuate and that you affirm that, um, that you draw your strength from. And your entire argument and your entire line of reasoning depends on your negating Jude. Depends on your negating Peter. Depends on your negating Paul here. Um, so you're not really putting on the armor of God, you're putting on the armor of the enemy. So instead of having your loins girt about with truth, you actually stand accused of having your loins girt about with falsehood, because that is that falsehood that you hide behind in order to maintain yourself and your religion and your theology, which are denials of the truth and are denials of God's word, and you know it perfectly well. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, again, you, you defend yourself against these accusations by creating all kinds of rationales for Jude, for example, or Paul, for example, being wrong here or in error here, right? That is, in a sense, the breastplate of unrighteousness, because it is unrighteous to deny the truth. Um, and your feet shod with preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, again, if you, if you, if you are not prepared to teach the truth of uh, the Bible, if you're not prepared to, to teach God's word, in other words, then you don't have your feet prepared, if you will. They're not shod, if you will. Um, it says, above all, taking the shield of faith, right? Again, when you don't believe Paul, because he's quoting this book, if you don't believe this book that he believed in, right? If you don't believe Jude and the books that he believed in, and he really went out of his way to talk about this stuff. I mean, I'm not harping on the subject. When he says you have to fight for it, right? Um, it hasn't happened yet, so you still have to fight for it, right? Otherwise, you're disobeying God's commandments, which is not cool. Um, this is the shield of faith. Well, if you don't believe the, if you don't believe the, that what he's doing is what he's doing, and there's no faith involved. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Well, it just is a fact, right? If I believe that it's so, and I go and I can show you and I can demonstrate that it's so, then I can quench the fiery darts of the wicked with that knowledge, because what power do they have against the truth? What power do they have against the word of God? They got no kind of power against that. I'll take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And it's from the word of God, it's from Ephesians here. And from Paul, whom we accept, or at least most of us do, and there's some of you out there who don't you know who you are. Um, but if the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, and again, this particular language is used by John in Revelation, so we should be surprised. You know, Paul uses the same language as Enoch, uses the same language as John, uses the same language as Moses, uses the same language as every other, you know, pseudepigraphal writer. There was a secret language that was once known, and that was destroyed on purpose. 
Um, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Right. And again, where is your concern for the rest of the saints when you don't really care enough to fight for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints? And see, then this is where Paul concludes. And it says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. We see, if this is it, right, Peter's saying it, right? This is an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, right? For these 2,000 years, he's putting up with it, right, on account of our salvation, so that this information can be restored to us when he says he's going to restore it to us. So knowing 2,000 years ago that it would be 2,000 years in the future, he's preserved it for us, and he's given us a way back into the Bible by placing these things in the canonical scriptures. Again, these books are not extra-biblical. The Wisdom of Solomon is quoted in what we call the Bible. The Book of Enoch is quoted in what we call the Bible. The Assumption of Moses is quoted in what we call the Bible. The Story of Ahikart is quoted in what we call the Bible. These things are not extra-biblical. They are extra-canonical. Right there, that you you need to learn what the Bible actually says, and to bring yourself in agreement with that in order just to see what I just now explained. If you don't, then I don't see how you can understand it after I've explained it so clear. It's almost in your face, obvious. So the utterance may be given to him. Why? Because he's speaking of these things, and we're giving him utterance. He's speaking that the wisdom of Solomon is okay, right? And we've denied him this utterance, but. <sighs> If we, if we put on the whole armor of God, not just some of it, you know, then we can actually do this and give Paul his utterance back. And then we can all have our common salvation and we can all defeat the enemy. It says, that I may make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bond. What is he subject to? He's subject to us, to our reasonings, right? It says, therein, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak, right? So his bondage is contrasted with... His, the boldness in which he ought to speak. Why? Because he's held in bondage in a sense that he cannot speak boldly. He's held in bondage in a sense that he cannot, he cannot be granted his utterance. He was denying him his utterance. The ones who were denying him his utterance are the ones who were denying Peter's interpretation of Jude and the story of Ahikar and his application to, um, of that mystery, of that teaching to himself. He says, us, the apostles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So again, this comes from Jesus. To us, the apostles, so says Peter, right? And to Paul. And then you go and you read Paul in an obvious and a very famous section about the armor of God, knowing that full well it comes from wisdom five. Everybody knows this. Not a mystery at all. It's just something people lie about. I just chalk it up to another classic Christian lie that they tell you, that they will tell you, that they will lie to your face. And when you really, really corner them on it, they just don't have an answer, right? But then again, that's the power to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. You can stand on that. You can give him utterance. You can release him from those bonds that we have put on him, right? And again, Peter speaks of these same things, right? Because when it says, as also in all his epistles, such as the epistle of the Ephesians, where he's quoting the wisdom of Solomon, even as Peter is quoting the story of Ahikar, alluding to the uh, assumption of Moses, right? Supporting Jude and his assertion that Enoch is ancient and prophetic, Right, and supporting Jude himself by incorporating nearly all of his letter into his own and then writing around it, drawing a line between what he's saying in his letter right here, right, to Jesus, giving us this whole authentic teaching straight from Jesus, straight through the apostles, straight through Paul, by means of Jude, who is using the book of Enoch, through which these books can be restored to us. There is a there is a way, there is a road, there is a path to accomplish these things. It says, as, all, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, such as you have to know what his utterance is. You have to know what his bonds are, right? But now that you see, now that his bonds are manifest to you as he puts it in his own language, uh, which you can, you can learn if you go to my Understanding Paul series of videos, which I have provided. It says, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. Now, when he says that seeing that you know these things before, what does it mean? It means that you know that Paul is going to be held in these metaphoric bonds, these metaphoric chains, that he's going to be held as a slave to men because his will is being bent to the will of others, which is basically the definition of slavery. Somebody rules you, owns you, pushes you around, makes you do what you don't want to do. And, and people are grossly unfair and, 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 and totally will not let Paul or Peter or Jude out of their prisons, so to speak. They keep them all in bondage. 
and you by doing nothing keep them in bondage, right? But you for not fighting for the faith that was delivered to the saints, keep them in bondage, and in a sense become guilty of your bondage, you know? And that's a pretty heavy burden once you understand what it is you're doing by your non-action, right? So you in the churches, right? You in, in, in the pews, right? What are you going to do about it? What are we going to do to make these things happen? What do we have to do? Are we going to let Satan have everything? Are we going to just let him continue to just push, you know, these uh, apostles around and keep them in spiritual bondage? You know, they can't do it. It can't be done. Sooner or later, it's going to happen. Well, you have done what you could do to make it happen. That's a pretty, that's a pretty serious question. I mean, what can you do? I mean, the very least you can do is to admit it and to affirm it, you know, and if you know Christians, if you know people, just show them. That's what you should do. If you, if you see these things, you have to have eyes to see and ears to hear. It's a language. It's a code. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a mystery, if you will. Um, but it's just, it's time to know. That's all, that's all there is to it. It's just, it's time to know. <sighs> ye therefore, beloved, seeing how you know these things before, Beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. But that did happen. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So, basically, he says that people um, twist Paul and the other scriptures to their own destruction. You can see how they do that. By disagreeing with the prophets, by negating the prophets. By denying the prophets their utterance, by keeping them in prison, and consequently us, the spirits of men, in prison, that Jesus has come down here to this uh, prison, if you will. The word of God has come down to us and shown itself, has lit a light, if you will. The light being the word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The, 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 the light is dawning, that the day is dawning, and the morning star is beginning to rise in our hearts. And, uh, you know, it is time for these mysteries to be known and to be shared and to be uh, explained. You know, um, and, you know, just whatever you can do to help. You know, um, you're not helping me as much as you're helping Paul, as much as you're helping Jude, uh, as much as you're helping Jesus, as much as you're helping God. Uh, really as much as you're helping every single Christian, every single believer, every single unbeliever who will come to believe and will come to see. Uh, you can do a lot of good if you, if, you, if you see this as an important thing because the days are short and the days are dark. Um, and they're getting darker and they're getting shorter. And uh, things are happening at such an accelerated pace that it really has become imperative that we act now. How much longer can we count on having our freedoms? How much longer can we count on having this wealth? How much longer can we count on having really uh, any kind of ability to, to push this message? I mean, at some point, the devil's going to feel threatened by this. And, you know, like so many times before, you know, all it's going to take is one action, one, you know, false, you know, flag, I guess, you know, one, um, one incident, right? And we could all be under martial law. That could happen today, you know, um, the, the time really is short. We need to do something about this. We can't just be goofing around and, uh, you know, just uh, pursuing our, we really have to fight for this faith. But the truth is that, I mean, the road has basically been paid, man. I mean, the, the, we have entered in on the labors of other people and all we're doing is, is harvesting what they have planted, you know. Um, but the field is out there and the harvest is ripe.